Good morning. It is good to see you today. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, if you have forgotten, uh, grab communion supplies on your way in. You can run out to the foyer real quick and grab those. We're all still having trouble remembering that, I know, and there's some trash cans by the door on your way out. If you'd like to uh, drop that uh, waste through on your way out, that's also where our contribution baskets are if you need that reminder as well. Really glad you're here today. I don't have a whole lot to share with you in terms of uh, updates on our sick list. I do remember uh, Kim and Kevin, their family. Uh, Kevin's, uh, Kevin's parents' home was hit by the storm that came through yesterday, took a little bit of roof damage down in Alabama. I think uh, they're going to get a little bit more information on that today. I feel a little bit weird making the seg from that announcement to this announcement, the announcement about uh, one building that's roof came off accidentally and another building that's roof came off on purpose. Uh, But if you have been looking around outside, it's been a pretty exciting uh, week or two for uh, the progress on all of our building stuff here around Burns. The old community center came down uh, starting this Tuesday. Oh good, it's nap time. That's my favorite. Uh, Usually we wait till the sermon to do that, but we'll do it a little bit earlier today. Uh, it was so cool to watch that come. People uh, stopped on the road to, uh, to watch. One guy came in and said, I was here in 1950 when they built it, and I was here in 1991 when it burned down, and now I'm here when they're tearing down the rest of it. But it was uh, uh, really good, grateful to Joey and his crew that this, uh, this happened. This is uh, coming. As I understand, the slab and the rest of it is supposed to go away this week sometime. Uh, progress inside the Jeff Kuhn Center is really uh, coming along too. Peek in those windows. In, when I say peek in those windows, now there's windows to peek in. Windows and doors. There's a new entrance on the side to your left. Uh, when you go inside, you'll look and you'll see the, the walls are framed up and hopefully that'll get moving more. We got some more electrical this week and wall stuff this week. It's just really coming along and that's thanks to so many of you who have shown up and hauled off buckets of junk, Uh, you've painted stuff, you've given money. Um, I feel like this is the time that I'm supposed to remind you that the fifth Sunday of this month is our special contribution Sunday uh, to continue to work on these projects. But it's just been so much fun uh, to see all of this stuff finally kind of get going, going in the right direction. Really grateful for all of you who've chipped in on that. While you're watching the church continue to come down, uh, not the church, the old school building, Mike Chandler did tell me he always knew I'd destroy the church. So, you know, there you, there you go, I guess. Um, uh, but while you're continuing to watch that, I'll let you know that May is going to be a big month for us at Burns. Uh, if you weren't in Sunday school with us this morning, you might not have heard that May 23rd is Glenn and Connie's last Sunday with us at Burns. And we, we're not happy about that. We voted to uh, reject that plan, but Connie, I think, seemed to have more authority than we did in that, that situation, I think. Uh, So we wish Glenn and Connie the best as they make the preparations for move to Texas. Also on the 23rd, we have a special guest speaker. My friend Zach Martin is going to be with us, so we're going to make that uh, a big special day for the church. Then on the fifth Sunday, uh, we are going to have combined services, 9 and 10, like we did in the first century. And we'll be in the fellowship hall for a combined uh, service that day. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to try out the fellowship hall and all of the upgrades we've made there. Uh, it'll be a good one Sunday there, then we'll be back to normal up here the weeks uh, after that. Um, just a lot of really good things happening, and there's so much that you have done. I'm so grateful for you and the work that you've done uh, here at the Burns Church. That's all I have to share with you today. Today we're kicking off some new things, so I'll share that more with you in a minute. Earl's going to turn on the lights so that you can wake up, and once you wake up, Eric will help us as we continue in our worship together. Oh
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly bow here today, Lord, thanking you for such a beautiful day that you blessed us with. Thanking you with another privilege and opportunity that we have to come to your house and worship you this morning. We pray, Lord, that our worship today will be pleasing in your sight. If we fail you in any manner, Lord, we ask you to forgive us. We pray, Lord, that you be with Matthew as he brings the sermon to us today. Give him the words that need to be spoken. That if someone here has not accepted you as their Savior, that hopefully they will do so today before it's everlasting too late. We pray for all those on our prayer list that are sick and suffering, those that have lost loved ones, those who may be traveling, those who are suffering from COVID or whatever disease, Lord, we just ask your blessings be upon them. Continue to be with this church here at Burns, Lord, as many things are happening and moving, and we just pray that you will help us as making decisions that everything will be in accordance to thy will. I pray, Lord, that you'll go with us now and forgive us if we fail you, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God.
notice in your bulletin or program, Drew Pleasant was put down to do three things in our service today. And uh, Dennis and I usually are the ones that try to put together to uh, make sure everybody's in their place on Sunday morning. And, and Drew was so good. And, and Jim, whatever, contacted me yesterday afternoon to let me know that uh, he's triple booked today. So I agreed to do the Lord's, and the Lord's Supper today. And it made me think about preparation because... Um, not only getting prepared to do the communion talk, but in preparation that we do before we participate in communion. You know, this is the most important reason that we're here today. It's the most sacred part of our worship. And it's the most defined evidence of our faith in Jesus Christ. It makes me wonder about our preparation the week ahead, year ahead, the day ahead, or whatever, uh, before we come to here to worship and to participate in this, the most important part of our worship. I know this morning it was um, uh, not the regular routine. We get up at our house and uh, uh, as we normally do, getting ready for, for church services and we usually hear the early service and part of the late service. And Sonia asked me, she said, well, uh, do I have time to go let the dog out? Andrew and Kiana are out of town this weekend. So we've been watching the dog and letting the dog in and out. So it kind of broke up our routine. But again, I kept focusing on what about, what about our preparation? How do we pre prepare to commune with our Jesus? How do we spend our time preparing ourselves? And do we prepare ourselves as, as if Jesus is with us? You know, Paul compared the union of a husband and wife to J Jesus and the bride being the church. And I've kept thinking about that, that, uh, that concept. Okay, if we are the bride of Christ. Well, historically, in the, the scriptures in the, uh, I think it was uh, Esther, we read that a young new king's wife, before she could even be with the king, she had to prepare for 12 months. Six months with oil and six months with perfume and cosmetics. And a year-long preparation to be the bride of our king. How much time do we spend in preparation when we're going to partake in communion with our Lord? Some thought. Some early Christians in an, uh, encountered protesters when they were trying to take the communion. You know, when Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood, and the early Christians met with some people on the outside said, these are cannibals. They're eating flesh and they're drinking blood. These are cannibals. They encountered some protesters, distractors. Later on in Christian leadership, when a new person became a baptized Christian, there was a three-month or longer period of time that they had to train and learn before they were even eligible to partake in the communion. You know, I know Puritans doesn't sound like a more modern history, but even in more modern history, the Puritans, not only were they out there trying to look, search for the witches and, and dunk them in water or strike up a, a fire and burn witches, they also suggested that a person could be put to death for taking communion in an unworthy manner. When you think about that as we think about preparing to take the communion, that Jesus told us as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you do so in remembrance of me. He also said the very last words in what we know as the Great Commission. He said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. I believe that Jesus is with us today as we're about to commune with him. And as we prepare our minds this morning, I want us to examine our faith in Jesus. I want us to confirm that the belief in that Jesus is here and now. And that this communion that we are going to ask God to bless is the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. If you'd bow with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you gave us Jesus. You put him down here as, to live amongst us as human beings, to, to live a life like a human being, but he was God. Thank you for letting him sacrifice his body on the cross for us and that we can always remember him as he told us to do. Thank you for allowing Jesus to be with us this morning. And please, if you would, bless this loaf as we take it at this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
You bow with me again. Again, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for this blood, the blood that he shed that wipes all sin away from everyone who accepts Jesus as, as a Savior. Father, we thank you so much for giving us this, this hope, this uh, uh, anxious and anticipation to be with, with you in heaven someday. And it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we pray that you'll bless this fruit of the vine as we take it at this time. In Christ's name, amen. Last week, uh, Frank had, had talked about how we rushed through the, the Lord's Supper Day. We've made it very convenient with the uh, communion cups with the loaf and the, the fruit of the vine in it. And it seems like we don't spend enough time uh, with the most important part. Everything has gotten to be more and more efficient. And I pre appreciate you indulging me in, in the, the talk this morning. As this concludes the Lord's Supper, if you would, I would like to say a blessing for the, uh, the offering this morning. If you would, pray with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that you give us this day and every day. We thank you so much for us being able to, to financially be able to take care of our families and our extended families and, and even help others in our community. Father, at this time that we want to give back to you, we're giving back to you what you've already given us, Father, but we want to give back to you and give back to this church that we may be able to grow, we can do with the funds as you would have us do. We pray that we, as a church, will always strive to be good stewards of your funds and that we'll always do right with you. Thank you so much, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Like those who like to stand and see. <clears throat>
scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 through 28. So, so have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I think this question is a little bit different in first service than second service, but how many of you have struggled with cataracts? Anybody? What I hear, I haven't experienced it yet, I know that surprises you. What I hear is it's really nice once you get those cataracts cleaned up and the colors get a little more vivid and the world gets a little bit more clear. I hear if you want a demo of what it's like to live with cataracts, all you have to do is hop in your car in Tennessee in the spring and try to see through the pollen. And if you can see through the pollen, you haven't been not, well, you've always parked in the garage. That's the only thing I can figure out. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now we don't see as sharply. There's something that kind of is obscuring us. I wear contacts. And the contacts are supposed to be good for about two weeks. I'm cheap, so I usually wear them for three or four. Don't tell my eye doctor that. But there's a time where they start to get a little off. And you can kind of feel it. And you can kind of see it. And it's just not quite right. And it feels really good when you put a fresh pair of contacts in after that. Paul says right now, you can see dimly. Like you're looking through a mirror. You ever uh, look through an old camera lens and you realize that the lens is just a little bit fuzzy? Do you ever walk up to the mirror to, shower, to shave after you shower and it's just a little bit foggy and you can't quite see what you want to see? One day, he says, you see clearly, face to face. It's really nice when you can see clearly. We always like it when we can see what's actually going on, when we can tell what really things look like. I think most of us like looking behind the scenes, don't we? We like kind of seeing how the world works. Turn on the Discovery Channel, and Leslie makes fun of me, but there's all these documentaries you can watch, you know, how it's made. She walks in and says, what are you watching? I'm like, didn't you want to know how containers of cream cheese are made in Venezuela? I mean, it's really, really interesting. We we like to get the behind the scenes tours or the backstage pass. We like it when you win the contest and you get to go in the tunnel where the Titans come out. You like that stuff where you can see what happens behind the scenes. When you can really see how things work. How many of you have watched a documentary or the extra features on your DVD or Blu-ray that tell you about the making of the movie and you can see how they put together the scenes? You like to see how it really worked. I'm a nerd that way. I really like to find out that stuff. If I were a cat, I'd be dead because curiosity would have killed me a long, long time ago. So I signed up a few weeks ago for uh, the Dixon Citizens Police Academy. Liz is doing that with me, and we get in trouble every week. It is so much fun. Uh, But a few weeks ago, I got to do a ride-along with one of the officers, and it was really eye-opening to hear them kind of narrate all of the things they're thinking about while they pull over a car, all of the work, all of the training. And he did something that kind of surprised me. We pulled this car over in the Huck's parking lot, and when he got out of the car, he walked back, and I noticed he's just, he stuck his thumb right on the taillight of the car before he walked up. He just did it while he was passing. I thought, that's weird. You know, the car's kind of, kind of dirty. I don't know. I particularly want to go, you know, petting the car when I pull it over. But as he walks, he just sticks his thumb on it. So I asked, what's up with that? He said, well, it's kind of a tradition we have. I'm leaving a fingerprint on the car. So if something goes badly, there will be proof that I was here. It was kind of a sombering moment to think about making that sort of conscious choice to leave behind evidence should this go badly. And you know, in in a lot of ways, it's kind of an outdated technique, I suppose, thanks to body cams and car cams and, and, and GPS locators and all that stuff. But it was something that he did that I've seen a thousand times you've driven by a car and seen a police car pull somebody over. But I never noticed that until someone pointed out what was happening behind the scenes. For the next few weeks, we're going to look behind the scenes together. We're going to take the book of Revelation, 
and we're going to try to look behind the curtain a little bit. This has been one of the most requested topics I've had in a long time. People keep saying, when are you going to preach about Revelation? And it's funny, because when they say, when are you going to preach about Revelation, they usually start saying, do you think the apocalypse is near? And this is the picture they get, you know, doom and gloom and life is going to fall apart. And I mean, 2020 kind of gave us that feeling, didn't it? I mean, we had uh, forest fires. We had, I don't know if you heard about this, there was this little disease called COVID-19 probably the first you're hearing of it that went all over the place. Uh, we had the, the economic stuff that happened. We had nerds buying GameStop stock. We had murder hornets. We had all sorts of crazy things that had us really kind of freaking out. But when you hear the word revelation, you tend to think of this word apocalypse, and you think of death and destruction and all of those movies. But that's not the idea behind the word revelation, and that's not the idea behind the word apocalypse. Can I show you something in Scripture? In 1 Corinthians 13, I just told you, now we see dimly, then we see clearly. Now we see uh, like we're looking through a dirty mirror or something, but then we see face to face. One day, everything is revealed. The word apocalypse sometimes is translated into English as revelation. And I wish that uh, we didn't have a book of the Bible named Revelation because our misunderstanding of that actually colors this whole thing. So when you hear the word apocalypse, you think, man, the world has gone nuclear, right? You know, we're all living in our bunkers and we don't have electricity anymore and we're all fighting Jeff Coons with a spear or something for lunch. Uh, but that's, that's not the picture. The picture scripture paints is a picture of something being revealed, exposed. It's a peek behind the curtain. It's showing us what's really happening. Jesus uses this word in our scripture reading in Matthew chapter 10. He says, there is nothing that will not be revealed. So don't be afraid. By the way, in this verse, the word revealed is that word apocalypse. There is nothing that is covered that will not be uh, apocalypse. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim in the housetops. So don't be afraid of all of this stuff because there is a revelation coming. When people hear the word revelation, again, they tend to start thinking the end is nigh and they start looking for wars and rumors of wars and plagues and locusts and, oh, this is the cicada year. We should add that to the list too. All of that stuff that makes really good television and really exciting books, that's not quite what scripture talks about, I don't think. When scripture talks about the revelation, the revealing, the apocalypse, it's not usually focused on the destruction, rather it's focusing on the revealing do you remember watching the Wizard, in Oz, Wizard of Oz? Do you remember when uh, Dorothy and her friends all finally make it to the great and powerful, uh, the Oz, the castle, the palace? I don't know exactly what you'd call this place. You hear the thunderings and the lightnings and all of that stuff. And then Toto runs and he opens up that curtain. And you find out that the Oz is not this great and powerful wizard. He's an old man in a bad suit who's pushing buttons. Do you remember what he says? Do you remember the line? Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. This is an apocalypse. The curtain was pulled back. There was a revealing. And you found out that Oz was not the great and mighty. You found out that Oz was an old guy with some machines. That's all he was. The truth was revealed. Reality was exposed. That's the picture that I want you to have when you look at the book of Revelation. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the revealing of the truth about God and his world. This is an exposure of what really is and what really will be. Don't focus on plagues and destruction and timetables. Don't pick up your newspaper and try to correlate every line with every date. People have been doing that for 2,000 years and they've been wrong every single time. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to look for how scripture reveals reality. That's the point of the revelation, revelation. Think about it. On Judgment Day, there are a lot of things that are going to be revealed. Uh, who's in charge of this world? Well, you're in church, so you, you know the right answer, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, Jesus, thank you. Jeffrey was not the right answer. Jeffrey was telling you that Jesus was the right answer. I had to clarify that. Who's in charge of the world? Well, a lot of us think that it's somebody in Washington, D.C., if we're honest. Or really, probably a lot of us think it's somebody in Silicon Valley, or maybe Beijing, or maybe in the Kremlin. But in the final day, what we have revealed for us is that the one who controls heaven and earth is not an elected official, and he's not someone who seized power. It's a lamb standing, though he has been slain. 
That's the real deal. That's how the world's really run. You know, there are a lot of people in the world who look like good people, but come to find out they're, they're frauds. They're people who take advantage of other people. You watch the news and it seems like every week you find a politician or a preacher or somebody who gets taken down because what they claim to be was not what they're really going to be. The revelation is a revealing about the truth of people too. It's a truth about the nature of the world. It's the truth about the nature of God. In fact, the first couple of chapters, Revelation 2 and 3, tell us the revealing of the nature of a few of these churches. Here's the truth about these churches. You have a reputation that you're this way, but the reality is this. We could use a lot more revealing in our world, and I think Revelation is going to help us with that. If you've been around Burns at all, you know what I'm going to ask you. I tell you that we're going to start studying a book for a couple of months, and you know what I ask every single time we do that, right? I'm going to ask you to do something insane. Buckle up. I'm going to ask you to actually read your Bible. Crazy thought. Now, I don't know if you know this or not. They don't pay me to, uh, to give you a book report on the Bible. They pay me to try to talk you into reading it. That's really kind of the way my job is supposed to work. So what I want you to do is I want you to read Revelation this week. And I want to take away all your excuses. I want to make this easy for you. On your way out in the foyer, I have printed little booklets kind of like this that have the book of Revelation in it. It's larger print. I know some of you can't see as well as you. I'm not calling you old, Eric, but some of you need those readers more than you used to. They're there for you, okay? And you can take notes in it and scribble and write your questions. I want you to grab one of those. I've got a couple of other things for you too. I've got some DVDs. Those DVDs have the Bible Project overview of Revelation. You're not going to agree with every word, but it's a really good approach, and I think you'll learn a lot from it. That's good. The other thing I have for you out there is a CD. That CD has, I feel like this is an NPR, uh, you know, infomercial. If you give $10, you'll get this, this, and this. They're free. Uh, But the CDs have those videos, they have the text of Scripture, and they have the audio Bible of Revelation in about five different versions. You can pop it in your car, pop it in your computer, and listen to it. The fourth thing that I have for you in the foyer are little postcards. And if you're more like an iPhone or an Android person, you can scan the little QR code on it and download all that stuff and you don't have to take anything with you. Just grab that and you can go. What I want you to do is I want you to get in this book of the Bible. Can I tell you a couple of things about it? It only takes an hour and 15 minutes for the average reader to read Revelation. That's the average reader. That's not me. I read stupid fast. I know that. And I know Jim Van Dyke reads really slow. That's all right. But most of the rest of you, it's going to take an hour and 15 minutes to read it. Did you know that the average American watches three hours of television a day? Don't tell me you don't have time to read Revelation once in the next seven days. You've got time. You're just choosing where you spend it. Sorry, but it's the truth. What would it have been like to have been one of the first hearers of this book? See, one of our problems with Scripture is we pick it up and we try to read it in 2021 and we start matching things. You know, humans, God gave us this incredible ability to see patterns. It's one of the things that keeps us alive. That's why when you're out in the woods, you can spot an animal that's coming for you. We're we're quick at recognizing patterns. It's one of the most human things that humans do. The problem is sometimes we also recognize patterns where they aren't. That's why our children see shadows at night and think there are monsters under their bed. It's the same part of the brain doing the same thing. The problem is when people pick up Revelation, they try to to match out the patterns. They say, there's this scary guy. That must be Bill Gates. There's this horrible monster monster. That must be Mike Gossett. There's this weird guy. It must be Eric. I don't know. And so what we do is we try to match, but we're doing the wrong thing. Read the story. What's being revealed? What is this revealing about God? The whole point of the book is to reveal to us Jesus. I want you to think about what it would have been like to receive this letter. In Revelation 1 verse 9, John identifies himself. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you know, John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, John, John, that guy, not Gabriel, this guy, the guy that Glenn's been talking about for the last month, that John, the beloved disciple, the disciple of love. Great, great story. We're not sure about all of the details of this, but Revelation 1 9 tells us that he is, he is in Patmos on an island on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And that phrase, on account of the word of God and testimony of Jesus, probably doesn't mean that the church bought him a plane ticket there. It probably means that he was sent there because he was preaching. He was sent there as an exile. He was banished to this island. Now, I can see the look in some of your eyes already. What do I have to do to get banished to an island in the Mediterranean? That sounds great. It's sort of like I feel about the nursing home. Sign me up. They cook for you. They do your laundry. I will go today if you'll let me. It sounds like a great plan. But evidently, that's not how it works. The story is that John was preaching and John was teaching. 
And the funny thing about Christianity, when you preach that Christ is king, the other guys who want to be king don't always like that too much. So the, the, the powers that be really didn't particularly like this. There's a story that Tertullian tells us. I don't know if it's true and I don't know if it's false. I wasn't there. If you want to check on it, ask James Hinkle. But the story is told that he ticked off the powers that be so much they attempted to boil him in burning oil. And he didn't die. And they said, well, I don't know what else to do with him. So they cast him off to this island. Now, they would cast people to this island of Patmos. And here it is on a map for you if you want to see it. All right, there is, there is Greece. You see it kind of highlighted. You see Turkey to the right, to the east. And if you zoom in on the coast of Turkey, you can kind of see this little isle of Patmos. Not much there. Even today, it's not that much there. And think about it, if you're the guy in charge and Liz Coons is leading this rebellion and she's starting to get people around her and she's getting really, really popular and really, really uh, starting to draw a crowd and you want to put that down, what do you do? Well, if you kill Liz, you've made a hero out of her. And now everybody follows. Now Jeff carries on the torch of the Liz rebellion, the, the Liz religion. Um, so what do you do sometimes? Well, maybe sometimes the best thing you can do to somebody like that is disappear them move them so you send them to the island john is living on this island patmos with political enemies potential revolutionaries some people who are up there and some people who aren't now if they're trying to get rid of you without killing you you know they're not going to go to this island and they're not going to set up a nice five-star resort for you this is not the nicest place on earth they're basically going to take you to the dock and throw you overboard and say good luck and if i ever see you on the mainland you're dead so john's not living in the lap of luxury out here by the way he's probably an old man at this point in his life he's been persecuted he's traveled and he's in this place they probably don't have trash pickup and they probably don't have broadband it's probably kind of like Hickman County somewhere. Here he is, and he's waiting. And what happens? Jesus reveals himself to him and says, there's some things you need to know. What would it be like to be one of John's friends? Uh, don't ask Kathy. We're still talking about the Bible, John. What would it be like to be one of this John's friends? To hear that he's been taken to this desert island and dumped off. And then one day... All of a sudden, you get a letter from him. You'd be pretty excited to get that. Well, what's it like? <laughs> Who have you met? Are you okay? Are you starving to death? What do you need? What's going to happen? And so John is on this island where he has been left to die. And he writes a letter to tell them about what it was like when Jesus revealed to him the way the world really works. Imagine how exciting it would be to read that letter. That's how I want you to read Revelation. Revelation is so funny because we, we are afraid of it. It is legitimately hard in some places. And it's hard, again, because we read it like we live in America in 2021 instead of like we lived in Jerusalem in, in 60 or 70 or 80 or whatever year it might be. But Revelation even offers us this promise. Verse 3 of chapter 1, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy. You know, I love that the book doesn't even say that you have to understand it. It just starts out saying, you will be blessed if you even read me. But what is this? The most neglected book of the New Testament? We don't even read it and we miss the blessing. Beyond that, it says, blessed are you if you hear. So if you want a double blessing, read it out loud. That way you get blessed when you read it and blessed when you hear it. And then if you really want to do good, actually listen to what it tells you. Because contrary to popular opinion, the book of Revelation is telling you how to live. If you know the truth about the world, it changes how you live. If you know the truth about Oz, you know how to live in Oz. If you know what's really behind the curtain, you know what to think about that wizard. If you know who's really in charge, it tells you how to view government or persecution or pain or fear or any of those things. The book is designed to reveal to us Jesus. And by the way, do you notice the bottom line of verse 3? For the time is near. When you go to verse 1, you even get this line, the things that must soon take place. That tells me when John wrote this letter to his friends in these seven churches of Asia, the stuff that he's talking about, by and large, was stuff that was about to happen. Now, every now and then, somebody will say, well, Matthew, 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 that's not what it really means. When it says soon, it means soon on God's timetable. Don't you know that 2 Peter 3 says that for God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day? You've, you've heard the old joke, right? You know, the guy says to God, is it true that for you, uh, a penny is like a million dollars and uh, a day is like a thousand years? And God says, yes. 
the man says to God, well, can I have a penny, please? And God says, sure, just wait a day. You know, it doesn't really work out for us that well. In this text, the idea was this is stuff that happens soon. So when you and I read Revelation, a lot of what we read is stuff that's already happened. It's stuff that's already taken place. Now, not all of it, and people argue about which parts are which, and that's all right. We may even disagree about some of that, but I still like you. Well, if I liked you before that, we'll still be okay on that term. But when I read this book, a lot of it is behind us. But you know what's cool about revealing things that have already happened? When I read scripture, it tells me, do you remember Ecclesiastes? There's nothing new under the sun. What has been is what will be. Do you remember those lines? (laughs) Well, if I read what has already been revealed, it's going to tell me something about what's going to happen now and in the future. It tells us about reality. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you see this in the title of the book? What it tells us, this book is not the book about the end of the world. It's the book about revealing Jesus, helping us see who is the great and powerful king of all kings. It's powerful for us. Revelation was designed to be practical. It's not all about assembling trivia or timetables about the end of the world. It's designed to teach us to live in difficult times. I think times probably are about to get more difficult for a lot of people in a lot of places. That's what I think. I might be right. I might be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. That's kind of what I think. It's what my gut says. Well, this is a book that tells us how to live when things are difficult. Revelation was written to churches in trouble. Some of that church trouble was internal. Some of it was external pressure. I read just a couple weeks ago that Gallup did a new survey. And for the first time since they've been taking this survey, church church attendance in the United States has dropped below 50%. Did you know that? When they started uh, putting together this survey in the 40s or 50s, that number was 73%. It's come quite a long way down in the last 50 or 60 years. If churches are struggling, maybe what they need is a revealing of the truth about God. A lot of these Christians who are reading this book were about to experience some persecution, some pain. And pain is difficult, and the difficulty of pain is multiplied when that pain is unanticipated Or it feels like it's never going to end. Here's what I mean by that. The reason it hurts so much to stub your toe in the middle of the night is it's a surprise. You didn't see it coming. That's why it's so bad. It doesn't even hurt that much. It just feels that bad because you were just trying to find your way to the bathroom and that's what happened. It gets you. But the other pain that hurts us is pain that feels like it will never end. That's why people with chronic pain suffer so much. That's why unexpected grief is so, so difficult to deal with because it's, it's a surprise and it feels like you'll never get relief. Well, when Jesus reveals himself to these churches, he's showing them the pain that you're going to experience. It's, it's not a surprise. And it's not going to last forever. Because there's coming a day when there will be no heartaches or pain or sickness or sorrow or death. There is coming a day when there will be no darkness, no death, no dying. The hand of God itself will wipe every tear from every eye some good news it's a revealing there is a lot more going on in the world than we realize you know I think that we are people who just kind of uh, we're like a fish in a bowl and we can kind of see that there's a room outside of the fish tank but we have no clue how big the world is you know in, in the New Testament it says that our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities and I'm not even sure I understand what all of that means but the world is bigger than I feel like it is. Revelation begins to let us peek behind that curtain. I got to tell you something and I'm not sure if it's theologically accurate. This may be wrong. I believe it. I may be wrong but I do believe this thing. You're going to think that I'm telling you a joke but I'm not. Wasps are from the devil. Okay, now that part was the joke. Uh, I I don't think there were wasps in the garden. I think that they evolved. That's the only thing that makes sense to me. They came from hell. That's why they're red and they burn like fire. I mean, it just makes so much sense. I, I think it's a slam dunk case. Okay, that was the joke. But let me tell you the serious part. I've taught middle school boys Bible class at Bible camp a whole lot of summers. And I've noticed something. I've noticed that if I'm teaching and it's a moment where all the kids are kind of leaned in, and they're listening, and they really get it. Andy, you know that look where they're tracking you, and you're about to have the light bulb moment where they get it, and you're about to share with them one of those gospel truths, like the power of God's grace that will change their lives, they'll hit it. You know what happens? It's when those stupid wasps show up. That's always when those stupid wasps show up. And then the kids are gone, and you lose the moment. 
You know what? You know what I have never had happen in all of those middle school boys Bible classes I've taught? I have never been about to play pin the tail on the preacher and the wasps show up. They never show up at the wrong time. I mean, they never show up at the right. You get what I'm saying? Now, I don't know if it's true or not, but I think those wasps come from the devil to keep kids from hearing the gospel. I told you I don't know if that's theologically true or not, but I believe it. I think that God, in this world, there's more that goes on than we realize. I believe the devil is trying to keep you from hearing this message. I think while you're thinking about the revelation of God, he's making sure the child in front of you is crying just a little bit louder to make it a little bit harder for you. That's what I think. I may be wrong. I may be right. Eh, it wouldn't be something new either direction. There is more to this world than we can see. We see what we see on television and in our families and in our church. But when I get to the book of Revelation, what I have is Jesus revealed. And I see that he is the king of all kings who holds all authority. He is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. He holds every key. He is more powerful than death. He is more powerful than the unseen realm. He is all that we need. But right now, it's hard for me to see that. So what I need is him to be revealed. And that's what revelation is. How would it change your life if the power and the presence of God were more fully revealed? You and I believe that God is everywhere, right? You remember when Jesus said, lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. You remember that line? So we believe that Jesus is here. David mentioned that. We believe in communion, that he is here with us as we take this supper. We believe that he is around every corner. What would it be like if we saw it? Revelation is a glimpse. This morning, I want to tell you that God is there. He is everywhere. You might not always see him, and you might not always think about him, but if you become aware of his presence, it will change your life. And what I hope that we can do together for the next few weeks is see Jesus revealed, exposed. I want us to see Jesus more clearly, because if we see him more clearly, it will change everything. This morning, if we can help you take a step closer to Jesus, we would sure love to do that. Let's Stand and sing an invitation song. There is coming a day when the Lord shall come. The Lord dwells in the sky. The Lord is within the eyes. All is His forevermore. All the
so good to see everyone here. We are increasing our number again as uh, things are changing in, in our world about us. We have 172 today. Uh, we hope we'll be getting even more back to normal very soon. We're glad that each of you are here. Uh, in the class, I, I mentioned introduced to those in the class, uh, some good friends of ours, a missionary, uh, Joe Evans, and his wife, Diane, are with us uh, from Heart Springs, Arkansas. They're just here a couple of days, passing through on the way to Florida and back to North Alabama to meet with other missionaries that work in India. Joe has worked there for about 30 years. Uh, in our class and study of Third John, that's about supporting missionaries. Joe's not here for that purpose. He didn't come for that, but I want you to remember his name, <laughs> what he does, and maybe in the future, you can be a part of that work that way. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're grateful that you have allowed us this time to assemble and to worship you and to fellowship with one another to grow in our knowledge and understanding through a study of your word. We ask that you uh, help us to uh, seek more the things that are above rather than the things on the earth, that we'll not ever lose sight of our goal and our purpose, that we'll use the brief time that we have upon the earth to be your servants, to be a light to this world of great darkness and this much evil and sin that's all about us. Help us to be that salt of the earth and the light of the world. Give us courage and strength and that we'll remain faithful to you in all circumstances, that people will see us and the good works that we do so that you will be glorified and many souls will be saved. Guard us in this day. In the name of Christ, we do pray. Amen. For our last song, I wanted to let everyone know if anyone that enjoys singing tonight at White Bluff at 7 o'clock, they will have their annual spring scene. Just wanted to let y'all know about that. I love to sing, and I hope to see some of y'all there tonight also. Let us end with a song here. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing this mercy of His grace.